Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. As part of EM Rapid uh, 2022, today we are discussing about uh, pulmonary embolism. We'll be discussing about uh, the definitions, then uh, causes, clinical features, and early management in emergency room. Pulmonary embolism means obstruction of pulmonary artery or one of the branches by thrombus, tumor, air, fat, which may be originated from uh, other parts of the body, especially uh, which may be coming from deep vein thrombosis uh, from the lower limbs. And sometimes it can go through uh, foramen oval or atrial septal defect. There are three types of presentation. It can be acute, it can be subacute or chronic. Patients with acute pulmonary embolism develops symptoms and signs immediately after the obstruction of pulmonary vessels. They can present with severe chest pain, which may mimic acute myocardial infarction also. Subacute means patients can have a chronic presentation. Mostly, they may not be acutely symptomatic, but chronically, they develop progressive symptoms like COPD with corporal malaria, something like that. Chronic means patients will have very chronic uh, symptoms. They have chronic pulmonary embolism, which may lead to pulmonary hypertension over many years. So we will be mainly dealing with acute pulmonary embolism, which is very common in emergency room. Other uh, two subtypes like subacute or chronic, which may go to uh, OPDs uh, because of chronic symptoms. Now we will see the risk factors. The most important risk factor for pulmonary embolism is deep vein thrombosis, especially in the lower limbs. It can occur from upper limb also. Uh, the DVT can be produced by prolonged travel immobilization or post surgery. You know, all these things, uh, patient can develop DVT, which may lead to pulmonary embolism. Other risk factors are obesity, smoking, surgery with prolonged bed rest, trauma with prolonged bed rest, hormone replacement therapy after uh, menopause, oral contraceptives, prolonged use of oral contraceptives can present with uh, DVT or pulmonary embolism. Antiphospholipid antibody syndrome can also have uh, symptoms like venous thrombosis or arterial thrombosis, which may lead to pulmonary embolism. Malignancies can present with uh, pulmonary embolism. Old age is uh, another risk factor for pulmonary embolism. These are acquired causes. Inherited causes are uh, antithrombin 3 deficiency, protein C or protein S deficiency, factor 5 mutation. All these things are inherited uh, risk factors. Now we'll see the clinical features. We'll be mainly dealing with the uh, clinical features of acute pulmonary embolism. Patient can have history of deep vein thrombosis. Superficial vein thrombosis may not present with pulmonary embolism. Sudden chest pain, severe cough with hemoptysis and breathlessness. This is the most common finding. However, many patients can present with pleuritic type of chest pain because if the uh, infarct or embolism is small, they may not have all the clinical features which is explained in uh, pulmonary embolism. They can have only pleuritic type of chest pain. If there is RV failure, then patient can have syncope also. That means a severe pulmonary embolism can present with syncope. Signs are, the most common sign is tachypnea. Some patients can have hypoxemia, cyanosis, tachycardia, hypotension, that is due to RV failure, elevated JVP, loud P2, when you are auscultating, you can get loud P2. Patient can have acute features of corporal pulmonary RV failure, like pedal edema, uh, hepatomegaly, tender hepatomegaly. All these things can present in some patients. Low grade fever, that is due to inflammation. Mortality rate of acute pulmonary embolism is around 30% without treatment. Now, there is a scoring system that is called as uh, modified wells criteria scoring system uh, that can uh, that is mainly used for assessment of pulmonary embolism 
So we can see here uh, there are different uh, uh, scores given for different uh, symptoms like uh, DVT, three points, other uh, diagnosis less likely than pulmonary embolism, three points, heart rate more than 100, 1.5, immobilization or surgery, 1.5 points, previous DVT pulmonary embolism, 1.5 points, hemoptysis, one, malignancy, one. Uh, again, uh, on the scoring system, you can see whether it is high probability, moderate probability, low probability. More than six is high probability for pulmonary embolism. Simplified or modified uh, well, uh, Wells criteria is uh, more than four is PE likely, less than four is unlikely. So this is scoring system uh, is available in uh, uh, in the net, you can uh, enter the values in that. You can get uh, total score or you can calculate the score by yourself. Now uh, we'll see what are the investigation can be done in an ER when we are getting a pulmonary embolism. If the patient is sick, uh, always uh, take care is airway breathing circulation, then go for investigation. One of the most important uh, tests done in ER will be D-dimer. But what we have to understand is D-dimer can be positive in many other conditions also. So if D-dimer is negative, if D-dimer is negative, we can possibly rule out pulmonary embolism. That is a most important role of this test in the ER. Suppose the patient come with acute myocardial infarction, also D-dimer will be positive. If somebody come with chest pain, we are suspecting pulmonary embolism, but if D-dimer is negative, then you can possibly rule out pulmonary embolism. ABG can be taken in ER that can uh, produce uh, hypoxemia uh, is one of the most important feature but if patient is having early uh, pulmonary embolism only tachypnea will be there so carbon dioxide washout also can be seen in some patients so that may not be a very good investigation in initial phase of the presentation. ECG the most common finding in ECG is sinus tachycardia. But most classical finding is S1, Q3, T3. That is S wave in lead 1, Q wave in lead 3, and inverted T wave in lead 3. But this finding may not be seen in all patients. Very rarely you can see this type of findings. Other common findings are patient can have RBVB, RVH, and atrial fibrillation. These are the common findings. However, the most common finding is only tachycardia. So somebody is com coming with chest pain, Tachypnea, tachycardia, ECG, may, ECG is showing uh, RBVB pattern. We have to suspect pulmonary embolism. And D-dimer, if it is positive, that adds to the diagnosis. If D-dimer is negative, we can possibly rule out pulmonary embolism in ER. Now, this is S1, Q3, T3, ECG. You can see here S wave in lead one. Uh, Q and uh, T wave inversion in lead 3. Now, chest x ray, you can see here two classical findings are Westermark sign, Hampton's hum. So, oligemia of lung fields because the, uh, the blood vessels are totally occluded. So, after this occlusion, you don't see any uh, lung marking. That is Westermark sign. Diaphragm can be elevated. Wet shaped pulmonary opacity is above the diaphragm, that is Hampton sum, pleural effusion, enlarged pulmonary artery. These are the common findings you see in, these are the classical findings you see in uh, chest X-ray in pulmonary embolism. But most of the time, when you have a pulmonary embolism in ER, you may not get any finding. X-ray will be mostly normal, like what we discussed about ECG. ECG and X-ray can be mostly normal in many patients, but classical findings are uh, Westermark sign and Hampton's hump. Now, echo is another important uh, investigation in ER to pick up massive pulmonary embolism. A small pulmonary embolism, you may not see any change in echo. Uh, the classical findings in echo in massive pulmonary embolism may be RV size can be increased, RV function is reduced, tricuspid regurgitation can occur due to enlarged RV. Abnormal septal movement with RV pre wall hyperkinesia and interventricular septal flattening. 
Ekonal sign, that is a regional wall motion abnormalities that spare the right ventricular apex can also be seen. Here in this echo field, you can see large RV. Sometimes you can get RV thrombus also. So the large RV can compress the LV and it can further reduce the cardiac output. Patient can develop symptoms of hypoperfusion like syncope, loss of consciousness, all these things can occur. Now the most important investigation in ER when we are strong suspicion of uh, pulmonary embolism is CT pulmonary angiogram. It is more specific. It can detect emboli as small as 1 to 2 millimeter. Another important investigation which can be done, but it is not an investigation of choice in ER. If there is a chronic pulmonary embolism or if the patient is stable or if CT pulmonary angiogram is not available, then we can go for ventilation, perfusion, scanning. So there will be a ventilation, perfusion mismatch here. Uh, ventilation is normal because lungs are normal, but perfusion is abnormal because the blood vessels are blocked. So VQ mismatch is seen in pulmonary embolism here. And CT pulmonary angiogram is the gold standard investigation for uh, making a diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. Here the contrast CT of chest showing a saddle pulmonary embolism that is red arrow you can see as well as filling defect in the left and right pulmonary artery branches yellow arrows uh, you can see secondary to obstruction by thrombotic material so ct pa is best investigation in er if possible now we can we have to, we have seen some uh, uh, procoagulant uh, conditions which can present with pulmonary embolism without any dvt or without any uh, any other cause so they are antiphospholipid antibodies like anti-cardiolipin, IgG, IgM, lupus anticoagulant, beta 2 glycoprotein antibodies. All these things can be done. So they are called as antiphospholipid antibodies, especially patients who is having uh, antiphospholipid syndrome or SLE or many other uh, rheumatological disease. This investigation can be done. Plasma homocysteine level, hyperhomocysteinemia can present with pulmonary embolism. This can present with uh, arterial and venous thrombosis. So that, that is very commonly seen in chronic smokers. Congenital problems also can be observed. Flow cytometry can be done. Protein C, protein S deficiency, antithrombin 3 deficiency can uh, uh, present with pulmonary embolism. The problem of this investigation in ER is whenever there is an acute uh, infarct or embolism there will be naturally there will be uh, 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 that body will try to uh, uh, dissolve that uh, thrombus and protein C, protein S and antithrombin will be utilized there. So the problem in these investigations are in acute thrombus or acute embolism most of the time this uh, test wave may be abnormal. So it can be done if the levels are normal we are possibly rolling out this condition. But if the levels are abnormal, we should understand that this test should be repeated after some times once the patient, once the patient is stabilized and once the patient is off on off anticoagulants. Like patient is, should not be on heparin or warfarin during that period. So protein S, protein C defi deficiency should not be diagnosed in acute condition unless it is not. We have to wait for uh, some more months to do the repeat investigation and confirm the diagnosis. If the tests are normal, then it is okay. We can make the diagnosis. We can rule out the problems. Factor 5 played uh, 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 in PCR can be done. Prothrombin 20, 21, 0 mutation testing can also be done by PCR. So these are procoagulant workup in a patient who does not have any risk factor for DVT or uh, pulmonary embolism or they have previous history of thrombus like this. Now initial management always starts in, uh, uh, with ABC in emergency room, airway, breathing, circulation because we have seen airway breathing problem can occur in many patients with massive pulmonary embolism. They can have hypoxemia because of uh, uh, ventilation and perfusion mismatch in the lungs. 
circulation problems can occur due to passive pulmonary embolism rv enlargement that, that may compress the lv and reduce the uh, output patient can have hypotension shock and all this type of patients may require support from uh, uh, iv fluids noradrenal oxygen mechanical ventilation like that oxygen should be started as early as possible if there is hypoxemia morphine can be used for pain management but if there is hypotension it should be better avoided iv fluids norepinephrine can be started if there is hypotension and rv failure dobutamin can be added with norepinephrine once the bp is stabilized like uh, systolic bp is in 100 millimeter mercury you can add dobutamin never start dobutamin first when the patient is having hypotension because that will produce peripheral vasodilatation and further bp fall can occur so in hypotension start fluids fill the rv then if the patient does not improve start noradrenaline then only dobutamin should be added now most of the patients who, who have pulmonary embolism require uh, anti-thrombotic therapy uh, if we are not thrombolyzing we have to start anti-thrombotic therapy we can start uh, heparin 5000 units bolus that is 80 units per kg then continuous infusion 1000 units per hour monitor APDT when we are giving heparin keep two times above the control for five days instead of that we can go for low molecular weight heparin where we no need to monitor the APTT or we can go for uh, factor 10 inhibitor pondopyrinux so enoxaparin is one of the most commonly used alternative for uh, unfractionated heparin that is 1.5 milligram per kg daily for five days along with heparin we have to start warfarin because warfarin these patients may require you know, oral anticoagulation for uh, minimum six months any patient who is saying dvt pulmonary embolism uh, with a risk factor uh, may require uh, these drugs for six months without risk factor like uh, antithrombotic like uh, thrombophilic conditions we may have to give like long so start along with heparin because it takes five to seven days to act uh, you can start with uh, 7.5 to 10 milligram per day then titrate down the dose according to INR values keep the INR in two to three uh, uh, level remember high dose is required initially then titrate down don't start uh, low dose and titrate up you have to start high dose and titrate down start along with heparin never never uh, start the warfarin after heparin always heparin and warfarin should be started together then once the heparin is stopped after five days by that time warfarin will start acting now thrombolytic therapy is reserved for massive pulmonary embolism or patient is unstable we routinely use uh, alteplase then mg iv bolus then 90 milligram infused over two hours streptokinase and urokinase also can be used embolectomy is indicated in patient with hemodynamically unstable pulmonary embolism in whom thrombolytic therapy is contraindicated is also a therapeutic uh, option in those who fail to thrombolyze so we have discussed in detail about pulmonary embolism and its management in emergency room these patients may require further investigation like if there is no other cause we have to investigate for the uh, secondary causes like malignancy workup has to be done uh, protein c protein s deficiency has to be worked up these patients may require long-term oral anticoagulation with uh, warfarin so repeated inr testing uh, monthly follow-up all these things are required we are not discussing all these things here we are we have only discussed about emergency room management of uh, permanent embolism thank you